Welcome back. This is Brooke Lance and Carly Dalton. And today we have Christopher Paolini coming back with us to discuss marketing. He is the international best-selling author of The Inheritance Cycle, also known as Aragon. And again, he just released his new book, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, which is fantastic. It is a science fiction book. I highly recommend buying it. It is available anywhere books are sold. And we're really excited to have Christopher on to talk about how he has marketed his books and made them the big successes that they are. So if you want to learn about how to make your book successful, this interview is for you. So stay tuned. We're going to bring on Christopher. And thank you so much, Christopher, for doing this for us. Uh, so was it hard for you and your readers, your audience, to switch from fantasy to science fiction? I mean, yes and no. I mean, personally, I have no difficulty switching back and forth. Um, I think, you know, To Sleep in the Sea of Stars has done very well. It has not done as well as Aragon, but I also never expected it to do as well as Aragon. It's not as uh, quite as a warm and fuzzy story as Aragon. So uh, the readers who have followed me along seem to have enjoyed the book immensely, um, but uh, you know, it's a different beast entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that yeah. said, if, you, if you've enjoyed Aragon, I think you would enjoy this series and excuse me, this, this book. And I, the more you read to sleep and the deeper into it you get, I think the more of my, my own peculiar uh, interests will become clear. And I, I think there's a lot of stuff that you would enjoy into Sleep in the Sea of Stars if you also enjoyed the inheritance cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of like educational information in it, which is really cool. But I hopefully like not preachy. Oh, well. uh -huh. There's a lot of like politics and cultural stuff in Aragon and then there's just a lot of like science stuff in this To Sleep in the Sea of Stars. Yeah, but, but I don't know nothing about science and you've had no, like I've been following, I'm not lost and there's no like info dump or anything like no. that. Well, I tried to save all the technical, like techno babble. Uh, it's all in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. There's actually a fake scientific paper in the back of the book on the faster than light travel. So I, I didn't put in the story. I tried to respect my readers and I satisfied myself by writing this fake scientific paper, which um, I'm rather proud of actually, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but no, I did not want to inflict that on my readers. Yeah, uh -huh. not at all. So do you feel like from when you published Aragon versus when you published uh, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, do you feel like the publishing industry has changed at all? Oh, it's completely changed. Uh, my family and I originally self-published Aragon. So self-publishing in 2002, yeah, 2002 is not self-publishing in 2021. For one, the ebook market didn't exist. Uh, there were ebooks, but they there were no readers available. There were no iPads, no, no Kindles, no Nooks no smartphones. So that market just basically didn't exist. And social media didn't exist. And of course, uh, you know, there was no pandemic when Aragon came out. So that's another large difference. Uh, I, I'd say the biggest differences are the ebook market and the social media platforms, because they change marketing. I mean, like, the fact that we're speaking now, this sort of an interview just wasn't possible a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, it was a kind of a strange experience for me because when To Sleep in a Sea of Stars came out last year, I was doing all of these YouTube interviews and virtual appearances and people were commenting on these videos and saying, oh, wow, you know, I've heard of Christopher uh, for years, but I've never actually seen him speak and da, 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 da. And, I'm, and it kind of blew my mind because I have spent literal decades doing hundreds of appearances for thousands of people, but none of that stuff's online, you know? Um, mm -hmm. None of it's online. So for a lot of people, that was their first time really seeing me speak or uh, seeing, yeah, seeing me speak. And that, that is one reason why I've been doing more uh, social media stuff recently because it's, it's, it's invaluable. Uh, I mean, when, when, when I self-published, my family and I self-published Aragon, I was doing two to three one hour long presentations every single day for months on end in schools, school libraries and public libraries. So, and that's not even counting all the <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of, of events I've done for Random House once they published the books. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, most, that, most of that happened before social media. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different landscape. You feel like it's easier now to self-publish? It's easier, but it's harder to get attention because there's so much material out there to compete with. Mm -hmm. 
And I would also say, if if anyone watching this is an aspiring writer and thinks there's a good chance they're going to get published, treat your social media professionally from the start. Because otherwise, what happens is your book gets picked up, gets a lot of attention, gets released, and then everyone goes and looks at what you've said online. And perhaps you said things thinking you're having a private conversation with your friends and small number of followers. And you know, having a large amount of attention on that may not be what you want and, and may not present your work in the best possible light. So treat your social media as a business uh, proposition right from the very start. They do tweet too. I have a friend who's in politics and he's like, oh my gosh, like anything I tweet or anything, like people will go back years and years, and years to try and find something negative to say or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I... I I think responsible parents keep their kids off social media these days. I mean, you have to, if you're going to be on social media, you have to be careful. Um, and, and I say that because it's like, you can be a wonderful person. You can have the best intentions in the world. You can be a supportive ally. You can be all of these things. But if you don't word something correctly, it can be misinterpreted. And that's unfortunate, but that's the world we live in. And the thing is, is trying to expect a teenager or even if someone who's right in their early 20s to be perfectly political, to be aware of every single issue is I think unrealistic. I mean, I was stupid when I was a teenager. I mean, I was, I was smart enough to write Aragon, but I was stupid and I didn't realize how stupid I was until years later when I got to look back at myself and go, wow, you thought you knew everything and here's all the things you really didn't understand. And I'm sure all many, many people have that experience. So social media is a two-edged sword. And I think that anyone who wants to be a creative should approach it as, in a business sense and not as a, I'm a hanging out with my friends sense. Mm -hmm. So has your social media been pretty powerful for you for marketing? Very. Uh, I'm a little late to the game because I was spoiled in a sense that Aragon's success and the Inheritance Cycle's success was so large, I didn't have to engage with social media the way I would have if the books had been successful, but not that successful. Um, you know, for example, Brandon Sanderson has done an amazing job of engaging with his fan base and providing them with awesome content and uh, they've rewarded him and supported him as a result. So uh, I have found social media very powerful. I've been working to really engage with it more and continually provide content for them. Uh, I have some assistants with, who help me with that. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thing is, though, it can be a full-time job. I mean, people make being a social media personality their full-time jobs. So you have to decide where your time is best spent. So I have a certain amount of time I devoted to social media. And then the rest of it is devoted to the writing and life in general. Uh, because ultimately, what's the best thing I could do for my social media? It's, it's publish a new book. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I don't want to not publish a new book because I'm doing Minecraft videos, which I would love <laughs> to do. I would love to do Minecraft videos, but you know, if I do Minecraft videos, then that's my job, not writing books. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. So for fi fantasy writers, do you recommend just posting posts about your books or, or posting like what kind of valuable content can fantasy writers especially uh, contribute to Instagram? Well, I mean, any yeah. way you can yeah. find to engage your readership in your work and your world is, is valuable because that makes, that helps people feel an emotional connection to your work and emotional connections are what drive fandoms. So whether that's you doing surveys, whether um, like I, I do fan art Friday uh, every week, uh, that's my, the hashtag. And I, I post fan art from To Sleep in the Sea of Stars and uh, The Inheritance Cycle. I also do Tat to Tuesday, Tat Tuesday uh, for uh, tattoos the fans have gotten. Both of those have been very popular. Um, you know, engaging with other people on social media who are your peers who uh, write similar things and you can talk to them and have little conversations on social media that can be valuable. Uh, if you have any sort of merch that you're doing, uh, you can run promotions for that, you can talk. Uh, but mainly I think just trying to be a nice person and appreciative of the support you get from your readers because without that we don't we don't get to do this um and and people respond to that positive energy they really do um i'm and i'm not saying be you know pollyanna ish with your um interaction but if you are genuinely grateful for this opportunity and generally 
genuinely grateful for this support, then express that. And you'll be amazed at the positivity that comes back. You know, I know a lot of people who have very rough experiences with social media, especially with Twitter. I don't have that. Um, but that's also because there are certain things I prefer not to discuss in public because I'm not an expert and it's not my area of um, social media conversation. So, you know, I don't delve into politics. I don't delve into religion. I don't delve into this or that. And uh, I just, I don't want to. Um, and I think it's, it's actually, it's been a good choice. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to let my work, my fiction speak for itself. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry. I think that's perfect. Hey, everyone, if you are liking this video so far and finding it valuable, please get leave us a like, subscribe and ring the bell so you be notified when our next video is up. Uh, how, how, how successful have, have um, interviews like this gone for you? Oh, they've been wonderful. Um, you know, lots and lots of views. Certainly more people see these sorts of interviews than would see an in-person presentation. So it's been a it's been a great option. Also, uh, I learned something over the course of the past year, which is if you have Twitter, if you have Instagram, if you have Facebook, if you have YouTube, there is very little overlap in terms of the, in terms of the audiences. Uh, 60, I think there's only like, now I'm forgetting the, the exact numbers. I, I heard this from a Facebook rep actually. Um, but I think it's something like 60 to 80% of the audience does not overlap between the different social media platforms. So if you post something on Twitter and you don't post it to Instagram or Facebook or your YouTube channel, you're missing a large portion of your audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think I saw too, and for our viewers, you post tips on writing as well on your own YouTube channel. Yes, I do have writing tips on uh, my website. It's in my YouTube channel, as well as lots of other cool things like um, music uh, for To Sleep in the Sea of Stars. Uh, I toured, they did a, some fans did an entire Minecraft server that's the world of Aragon recreated in a one-to-one -one scale. So I toured that recently. Uh, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. What's well, called crispy writing tips, right? Yes, crispy writing tips. Crispy. Crispy. <laughs> I love it. I actually just subscribed to it yesterday because I found awesome. it. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so when you uh, when you were marketing Aragon, you mentioned you spent a lot of time at schools, uh, mm. like interacting with kids and stuff like that. Would you recommend that as a writing or a marketing strategy now? Absolutely, if your material is appropriate for schools, as anything under college that is. Uh, if you go to a bookstore and you set up a table and you talk to every single person who comes through the door and you're decent at sales, you might sell 40 books max in a day. And that's on a really good day. Most days you're probably gonna be selling around 13 to 14 books, which is not enough for gas, which is not enough for printing costs, which is not enough for a motel somewhere, which is not enough for even uh, crappy Taco Bell. Um, <laughs> ask me how I know. Uh, so. Schools are great though, because you get a captive audience. And if you have a presentation that deals with reading and writing and inspiring young people to do the same. And if you speak to the school librarians about uh, taking pre-orders before you do your presentation. And if you, <laughs> um, you know, are willing to put in the work, then that can be an exceptional opportunity and a great, great way to engage with a fan base. Um, I mean, again, this is just purely the commercial side of things. Oh, oh, of course, the schools often have speaker, they have money allocated for speaker fees uh, for bringing people in to the school for, you know, enrichment programs. So, you know, if that can cover your basic expenses, then the rest is gravy. And I'm not trying to just be commercial about this, but it is a business. This is the business side of things. So, we went from, as I said, if I went to a bookstore, being able to sell, let's say, 13 to 40 books was the range, mm -hmm. to selling an average of 300 books a day going to the different schools. And that, that was workable. Uh, the logistics were a bit difficult in terms of, you know, like how many books to go here, how many books to go there, and how many we could fit in the car, but that worked. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. and the way and the and and the way you get those gigs is you just cold call the schools and say, "Hey, I would like to talk with a school librarian," 
And then you tell the school librarian, you say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I've written this book and I have a presentation all about reading and writing and helping inspiring young people to read and write. And, write. Uh, and you're gonna call 10 schools and probably nine of them will say no. But if you get one that says yes, then you get your foot in the door and school librarians talk to each other. In fact, like in Texas, they actually have like an like a internet chat group or something just for the school librarians there in Texas. And uh, if you make a good impression with one appearance or a couple appearances, then you, they will recommend you to other schools. And before you know it, your, your social calendar is full. There you go. That's right. <laughs> So yeah. you started out self-publishing, right? And when you got when you got traditionally published, did you feel like a lot of the marketing weight was taken off your shoulders, or did you feel like you still had to market the same? Um, yes and no. Uh, publishers can do a lot more for you, especially if they're investing in your work. You know, if there's mm -hmm. if it's a decent advance, then they're going to want to earn that advance back. So they're going to definitely do what they can to earn that advance back for themselves and for you. The effort doesn't really decrease, it, it shifts focus. Um, certainly it was easier to not be dealing with all the logistics of self-publishing and going to various locations and handling it all ourselves. But going on book tour, if you're lucky enough to have a book tour is still enormously draining in terms of your time and energy. It's a wonderful experience. And if you're lucky enough to have it, you do it and you're grateful for it, but it's very tiring. And odds are you're going to get sick doing it because you're meeting a lot of people and you're doing a lot of travel and you're probably not getting a whole lot of sleep. Um, in terms of pr promotion outside of that, you can do as much or as little as you want to. You will certainly be doing interviews that the publisher arranges for you, but those don't take a huge amount of time. Um, after that, it's really up to you how much you want to promote on your own and the sky's the limit as far as what you do. I mean, you can do as much or as little as you want or as much or as little as people are willing to let you do. Um, if you can manage to get on any sort of television show, you will notice a huge boost in sales, even local television, you know? And that's one reason why uh, when I would go into a market to do uh, school presentations, I would always do at least one presentation at the local public library because you cannot get media coverage for a school presentation because it's not open to the public. But mm -hmm. if you do a public library event, even if one person shows up, doesn't matter because you can probably get a little article in the local newspaper. Maybe you can get an interview on the local radio station because you can call them, you can contact them, say, hey, I'm doing this inter this, this event at the local library and uh, would you guys like to cover it? Would you like to do a little article? You know, or with the radio station, would you like to interview me? And then you get your, your media coverage. Uh, if you get national media coverage, like you get on the Today Show, for example, um, you know, your, your sales just go through the roof. But that's, that's very, very, very hard to get. And usually you either need to be in politics or you need to have some sort of novelty attached to your product that's gonna make you interesting enough for them to stick you on the show. Mm -hmm. So of course we got a lot of questions. I think authors always dream of their books being made into movies and all that. So what was that experience like? Would you ever sell off your rights to a book again or would you prefer to keep them like how you're kind of doing with To Sleep in a Sea of Stars mm. where you are very hands-on with the screen? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a surreal experience and I didn't appreciate how strange an experience it was until many years later because I had no experience in life. You know, I was 18, 19 when Aragon came out, 17 for the self-published edition. And then, uh, you know, the, the movie was a couple of years later when I was 23, 24. And as far as I knew, you published a book and this is what happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, that isn't what happens. And it was just a real, it was, it was just a perfect storm of luck and hard work. Um, the communication in terms of the experience with the studio and the whole process of the film getting made was not great. Uh, I had some correspondence with the guy who wrote the screenplay and he was definitely trying to be true to the book when he started out. Um, and we had some very nice conversations. And then of course, notes from the studio and, and other people sort of pushed it in a different direction. Um, and we didn't even really know the film was happening until it was basically in production and it was about to get filmed or was filming. I mean, we just were not part of the process. So that's why I want to be hands-on from here on out because I want to have a say, or at least some, you know, at least 
to have my voice being heard, even if they go in a different direction, at least I've made an attempt to, you know, uh, ensure the product's going to be as good as possible. That's ultimately all I want. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not going to be directing a film. That's not my thing. I'm not going to be doing X, X, Y, Z, but at least I want to have uh, some say in the process. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And would I do it again? Uh, if I were going back in time, we did not know Aragon would be the success it was. So we, if we had known, I think we would have held out for um, perhaps a different team to work on the film. But the flip side is, again, the film really drove the interest in the series and um, helped us in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's, it's very easy to second guess and you can't ultimately second guess. If, if someone comes to you and says, we want to make a film out of your movie and they compensate you appropriately and they actually make the film, regardless of the quality of the film, you kind of won right there. You kind of won. Yeah. yeah. It was an awful, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so was it just like a, a surreal experience when you when you heard that it was going to be made into a movie? Yeah, yeah. Um, and seeing it, of course, was even more surreal. Uh, playing the video game based off the movie was really weird. <laughs> um, it would be so cool. Yeah. It was, it was. Uh, yeah, it's it's been an odd, it's been an odd life. <laughs> it's been an odd life. <laughs> uh, it's it's really cool to hear how much you've taken it into your own hands. Like literally, just how I think a lot of writers think that, that they don't have to do marketing if they get it traditionally published, or yeah, or that they can just have a social media presence, and if their book is good enough, it'll sell. But like, so something that I really had to wrap my brain around, and has been incredibly helpful for me is to realize that you are in charge of the process. You know, if you sit around waiting for your publisher to do everything for you, or even for your publisher to bring you ideas for how to develop or, or expand your franchise, if you have a franchise or a series or a world or what have you, or even just your career in general, then you're going to be waiting a very long time. You know, it may happen, but that's not their job. Your job as the author is to be the ideas person. And so looking at how other authors have handled this and how they've done it successfully is important. The nice thing about writing in sci-fi fantasy is there is a community for it that doesn't exist for other genres. You know, we have the conventions or we had the conventions and we will have the conventions again in the future. You know, we, there is a huge community for fantasy and science fiction that is not there for, you know, historical, no historical novels as an example. Mm -hmm. So you can tap into that and you can look at how other authors are doing this. And I do think you should take ownership of it. Now, this is really dependent on whether or not you have the time. So if you have a full-time job and writing is your side gig, then you're going to be limited simply in terms of your time, but you can still do stuff. And that's where, um, if you're serious about this, you know, learn some stuff about marketing, you know, learn some stuff about persuasion, uh, learn stuff about social media. Uh, and then decide where your time's best spent. I think too, I mean, for you, obviously you're clearly driven to, for a 17 year old to be going into libraries and making those phone calls, doing that. It's like, you deserve yeah. the success you've had. I can't, I mean, when I was 17, that is not where my, <laughs> my priorities were. I don't, we won't even get into that. But yeah, like for, for that, I mean, that's really incredible in its own, just the driving that. So. Well, part of the drive came from desperation because my family was always, my parents have always been self-employed and they helped edit and prepare Aragon for self-publication. And that was a whole chunk of time that they were not working on other projects, you know, to bring income in. <clears throat> so by the time we self-published Aragon, if it had taken another three months to start turning a profit, we were going to have to sell the house, all move to a city and get whatever jobs we could. So having some desperation or having some skin in the game, if you will, you know, uh, will push you out of your comfort zone. I am not someone who naturally wants to go up in front of an audience, or at least I wasn't. I'll do it now. I wasn't back then. I was a homeschooled kid who liked reading, who liked doing his own thing. And that was so far out of my comfort zone. It's not even funny. So, you know, it's why, <clears throat> again, to stereotype, uh, sorry. <coughs> Sorry, uh, to stereotype, you know, it's why children of very wealthy parents often don't do as well as children of parents who, you know, had to struggle and scrape a bit uh, because they don't, 
have to scrub, struggle and scrape to survive. Mm -hmm. um, there are exceptions, of course, but you need to have some hunger. You need to have a little bit of fear of the wolf nipping at your heels or a desire for something in the future that will drive you out of your comfort zone. And I'm still doing that to this day. I mean, I, I don't have to do all the work I do with social media and everything else. I really don't have to. I could just, you know, go sit in my room and write and not think about that stuff. But I want this. I want to keep building this stuff and not to just sell books. You know, I've done fine on that side of things. I'm fine on that side of things. It's to create this community. It's to share these stories with my, my fans and, and readers in general. Um, I, I love that. And I love creating for people. And if I weren't writing, I'd be a woodworker or I'd be a metalsmith or I would be you know, a musician or I'd be doing something to create things for other people. That makes me very happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful note to almost end on too. <laughs> <laughs> you do it for the fans. You do it for your readers. That's yeah, I mean, being paid for it's nice. I'm not going to lie. It, it really, you know, financial pressures are not fun. And if you are constantly stressed about money, it's going to be very hard to write with any sense of uh, joy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a reason why giving deadlines to writers tends to actually work out better in the end. Uh, one reason for that, too, is especially in fantasy, we tend to overthink our prose because there are all these examples of writers who write beautiful, eloquent sentences and often in an archaic manner. But if you have a deadline that is forcing you to move along at a quick clip, you'll start dropping the extraneous words because you don't have time for them. And you'll start dropping out any descriptions that don't move things forward because you don't have time for them. Uh, you can go too far with this, of course, as with anything, but it's, it's a good urge that Every sentence, every word, every paragraph should be providing useful information to the reader and should be driving things forward. And if it's not, why have it? Now, you can, you, can, you can justify a lot of things that way. You could say this paragraph of description, which is describing the sun and the stars and all of this, um, it's setting a mood. You know, it's creating an emotion in the reader. So it, Taking this approach doesn't mean you write just complete bare bone, bones prose, but it makes sure that you have a justification for every single thing. And if you can't justify it, yank it out. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Well, hopefully both of you will enjoy the rest of um, To Sleep in the Sea of Stars. It's- uh, Yes, we will. And I just got an email from my agent with some sort of reaction to the story I just sent him. So um, I am now having, I get to have the experience of biting my fingernails till I know what he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the thing is, is I have um, gotten to meet a lot of authors who've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, I met Alan Dean Foster one time, sci-fi author. He's done Star Wars novelizations, bunch of original stuff. When I met him a number of years ago, he had published around 120 novels. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, hey, you know, I read your stuff growing up, big fan. You've written all these books. Does it ever get any easier? Mm -hmm. And he stopped. This was at Comic-Con in San Diego. He stopped in the middle of a crowd of thousands of people and just started laughing. And he said, no, he says, never gets any easier. He says, I start every book feeling like I'm the best writer in the world. And I know exactly where I'm going. And I write and I write and I write and I get into the middle of the book. And I feel like the worst author in the world. And I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And I don't know how I'm going to finish this. And I feel like a fraud. And this is the book. Everyone's going to realize I don't know what I'm doing. And then I just keep pushing through and finish it. And it all works out in the end. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. So it's, it's, it's going to be a lifelong thing to it. <laughs> well, the reason I was talking about like getting used to mistakes is if you can learn to endure a certain amount of discomfort um, within reason, but that discomfort specifically with regard to the resistance to starting or finishing something, the discomfort with worrying about how other people are going to view your work, the discomfort of working on the same project for months or years, which is often very hard to do. If, if you can learn to put up with that, you will be incredibly productive and consistent. Uh, and the authors who are productive and cons consistent have, have, found, have found a reason to overcome the discomfort and a reason to find joy in it. You know, those, those people who wake up at five in the morning to go for a jog every day do it 
because they get a reward out of it that overcomes the discomfort of that. You know, I, I actually believe humans are ultimately hedonistic at their heart. You know, we do the things that provide us joy and rewards. And you have to find a way to reward yourself or find joy in your process, even if it's an inherently discomforting uh, or uncomfortable process. Uh, and that might, and, and the thing is, you have to actually get that reward. It, it can't be, you can't fake it. It has to be a real reward. You know, that's why we say to people, do what you love. Not because that's great career advice. It actually is horrible career advice. Um, but because if you enjoy it, you're going to spend the time to do it and become really great at it. You know, if you become a doctor just for the money, you're never going to be a great doctor because when you get home, you're going to be exhausted, you're going to crash, and you're not going to think about medicine. You're not going to think about your patients. But the person who really loves being a doctor is going to go home and they're going to read the latest medical journals. They're going to read the latest studies. They're going to think about their patients. They're going, they're going to put in that extra work that's going to keep elevating their skills until they're truly one of the best. So that's why you have to find the joy and the pleasure in, your, in the process. I mean, I hate sitting at a computer. I was a very active boy uh, and teenager. I love moving. I hate sitting. Mm -hmm. But I found ways to overcome that in order to be able to write and produce in the way I want. Yeah. I hate sitting too, and I spend all day at a computer. I know, right? <laughs> It's, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, uh, that, that leads into a whole other conversation about fitness for writers, but it's incredibly important. Um, and even if you, fitness is not something you have any sort of aspirations toward, you don't have no goals in that direction. That's fine. If all you want to be is a great writer, you need to move in some capacity because you can pull up study after study that shows that moving and exercises improves your cognition, improves your brain function. So if you want to be a great writer, you need to move so your brain works properly. Uh, even, even if it just means walking. You know, walking is probably the greatest exercise in the world. So go for a walk every day. You'll be a better writer. I like that helps when I'm stuck on a scene too. It's like you walk and then I'll yep. start, start having dialogue. Start thinking about things yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. 100%. Well, this was a lovely conversation. So yeah. thank you so much. We enjoyed it. Was it was really awesome to meet you. Yeah. Same, same. <laughs> I would totally love doing this again some other time if you guys are up for it. In the meantime, I wish both of you all the best with your own writing and of course your own reading. Yes, you gotta have both. <laughs> gotta have both. Okay, well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Great. Have a good one. You Bye -bye. too. See ya. Thank you everyone for watching. We hope that you found this uh, video valuable and have learned some new things about marketing. If you haven't already, be sure to check out his newest book, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. It is a fantastic science fiction novel that we think that you'll really enjoy. If you haven't already, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you'll be notified when our next video is up. Thanks for watching. Thank you.